Was it hard to walk away from the prom queen stuff? Because obviously, like, you guys, I think most people in Australia would know, like, you guys were fucking massive. Like, when going from being an indie band, I remember you guys coming through Perth and it just, it was like a touring um, merch festival for starters. I remember just everyone was just wearing prom queen stuff constantly. And the shows you guys were doing were crazy. And um, obviously then, I remember you guys did that um, when Goodbye Means were going to America tour i think that was the first time i'd seen you guys and obviously yeah fully killing it or it certainly appeared that you were killing it from from the perspective of people out here and then you guys took off to sweden i believe to do the second record and it kind of that was where the big bump sort of started was it tough to because it was obviously your baby it was something that you were founding member of to leave that and go to bleeding through was that a tough decision or was it kind of like i'm fucking done um it was a snap decision. So I, I think I just kind of, there was a bit of writing on the wall there. Um, generally, like I remember Sean was pretty bummed that whole European tour. And he was like, he was kind of always the guy that would get a girlfriend back home and then was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do the band anymore. Or, you know, he was like real focused on what was going on back home. Um, yeah. The crafter thing that went down, he just kind of we were there was a rift between us and it definitely like there was a huge divide when we went over and did that record because the four of us saw that as like this is the next step man like we're going to record with this world-class producer that's recorded every one of our favorite metal bands like we're about to put so much money and effort and time behind it and yeah he was just kind of like dropping the ball a little bit um kind of came to the studio unprepared and he might, I think he might've even talked about it with you guys, but he, um, he like, we we got to a layover in Sweden to start that recording. And he was like, Oh, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to fly to Amsterdam for a few days. My, my ex is there and we're like, kind of going to like hang out <laughs> and we're like, <laughs> what? Well, we're about to start recording like in three days. Like, yeah, it'll be sweet. You guys will do drums and guitars first. <laughs> um, that is such a, such a craft so, move as well. Yeah. We ended up losing, I think, the drum kit or like some of the guitars and stuff rocked up late. But I mean, it worked out fine. He 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 rocked up. I remember that studio session was painful because we were we were very focused on like what we wanted out of it. And Crafter was kind of like used to just doing things his way. And we were like making him sing things the way that we thought that would come across best in the record, which we didn't do before that. We were really like analyzing everything. And I just remember like we would be there till like three in the morning and I'm like chopping up crafter vocals and like mashing them together and doing crossfades and, you know, and it sounded sick. I didn't, people have probably heard the crafter version now because it ended up kind of coming out as a B-side thing years later. Um, but yeah, it was just, just this whole kind of series of events and that led to the breakdown with him. And then, um, and then we got the guy Ed from the UK who came and re-recorded on that same album. So we just kind of wiped all the vocals except my clean vocals, rewrote like almost all the lyrics besides a few that like myself and JJ Kev had written um, in some of the choruses and put that out. And so that was kind of like the next step was that record was like an, a level up for us and definitely like, you know, increased our success as a band and the size of the shows and things like that. And Ed's voice was just like, at the time it was like, phenomenal and people hadn't heard those kind of like highs and lows and you know varied kind of borderline deathcore vocals so it was kind of like good timing fresh sound um but yeah that didn't last long either you know there was just we brought this young kid over from the uk and we're like you're gonna move to adelaide and (laughs) we it wasn't a time where you'd be like cool be away on tour for nine months out of the year like making all this money it was like all right, cool. We've got this run in like the West coast. I'm going to do two weekends and then we're going to sit around for two months and we had to figure out how to like pay for him to live there and stuff like that. So was it a slog when you guys that, first kicked, kicked that off? Um, or did you find that it gained traction quite quickly? Like what was the progression, I suppose, from inception to the point where you were like, fuck, this is actually a thing. Yeah. It, it, it was, I guess in hindsight, it was, pretty quick as far as like you know we i think we put out our first release in 2002 and by 2004 we were touring the states so that's you know two years and this back then when like bands didn't leave australia really and you know it was kind of it was just 
different time, I guess. But um, I remember like this weird point where I felt like we, it was just a fun thing. Like, cool, let's go to Melbourne for the weekend. We'll book some shows. Oh, cool. Shot Point Blank wants to like do a tour. You know, Graham from Resist will help us book it. And we'll just, it would, we were just like messing around, you know, and like at the time we were all pretty much on the doll. And I remember like having to go put in our doll form in Byron Bay and they're like, why are there five of you from Adelaide here? <laughs> there was a nickname like the John Howard skateboard team. <laughs> and, um, but it went really quickly from that to like, oh, like we just sold a bunch of merch and like we can pay each other like 50 bucks after tonight. And then I don't know, it was it was a snowball for sure until that kind of, you know, implosion with the, the changing of the singers and stuff like that. Yeah, you guys, are, you guys were absolutely massive here. I just remember, especially I, I remember the first time I saw you guys, it was like seeing it was something I'd never seen before because I'd been playing in bands and seeing bands play um, in Perth like so many times. But I remember seeing you guys play Capital for, I can't remember what the show was. It was like Punk Suey, I think it was called. And it was like, yeah, you were jumping off fucking PA stacks. And it was kind of, yeah, it was, and you're all kind of weird, almost goth skate kids. <laughs> it was just like, I was like, I've never seen anything yeah, like this before. Yeah. We did have phases. Yeah. We had some phases for sure. Um, it's funny because like in hindsight at the time, yeah, we were like, we were the biggest, one of the biggest heavy bands in Australia. Um, but it's so sick looking at what the scene is now. And like, you know, we were small time compared to where, where these other bands like Parkway and Amity have taken it. But yeah, it's nice to have been a part of that like legacy, I guess, of like heavy music in Australia. I remember seeing videos of like Hellfest and Furnace Fest and all those big American fests back in the day and like bands like Norma Jean and the Dillinger Escape Plan and we were like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna sound like Poison the Well, but like heavier and we're gonna go as insane as we can live with our guitars throwing stuff and like Kev broke a headstock at one show and like I've got photos of him like bleeding from like smacking his head on speakers and stuff. So we were sort of I don't know. I don't know that we were doing anything musically like mind blowing or um, that hadn't been done before, but maybe it hadn't been done in Australia before. And it was at a point where the internet was just kind of helping music out. And we just were in right place, right time to like ride that MySpace hype wave and, and, you know, be the first band in Australia to sound like a poison the world or a metalcore band. So what was it like being in a successful band and having like MySpace being a thing? Because, you know, post that, there wasn't really anything social networky outside of like, you know, MSN Messenger or something like that, which is kind of like P2P. It's very direct, whereas MySpace kind of opened yeah. up communications to everyone. What was that like as, a, you know, a famous person essentially in that time and having, you know, people hitting you up randomly? Was it mental? Um. I'm trying to remember what I remember about MySpace days, but I do remember, I think, I think it was that first time we went to record in Sweden and we ended up playing this weird little hardcore festival, like in the middle of nowhere in Sweden, we just kind of jumped on the bill. And then I think we did a European run or sorry, a UK headline, like maybe right before that, we kind of like went back to back to back with a bunch of stuff. And I remember like seeing the MySpace numbers, like jump up. It was like, bands could go viral in this weird MySpace way back then where like you would, you know, one minute you're at like 5,000 followers and then you do an overseas tour and it just spreads and people are putting your song in their profile. And I, I remember like the numbers jumping up significantly. I remember bulletins were sick because we'd be like, we're stuck in the middle of nowhere and we don't know anyone. Like, can we sleep somewhere? And then like some random would hit you up, you know, in, in response to the prom queen bulletin and, we got like free skateboards and just random <laughs> shit from that. Um, I didn't like, I don't think we really felt like, you know, stars or celebrities um, at that point. We definitely like, we started getting, I call it getting recognized eventually. Like, you know, you'd be in the mall in Brisbane or something and a bunch of punk hardcore kids come up to you. But yeah, that's yeah, pretty. Space was a trip. Club, I, 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 I,